Welcome to Manna for Breakfast, the daily Bible reading devotional which chronologically takes you through the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation in one year. Grab a cup of coffee and your Bible and join us as we journey together through God's Word. All right, good morning, everyone. This is our last day here. We're leaving this morning. Heading out for Virginia, so be, be praying for our trip, if you would, please, for safe traveling um, mercies. We've got about a about a seven-hour drive ahead of us, so looking forward to it. It's a pretty country. Uh, cold, though. Cold today, so we're looking forward to that. So we want to jump right into it this morning as things are moving fast around here, so if you would find your place, please, in Job chapter 8, we'll get started. Father God, thank you for this morning ask you to bless this day, bless this time as we come before you and guide us, God, into all truth as we are looking into these things, into your word, in Jesus' name. All right, Job chapter 8. Then Bildad, the Shuhite, answered, how long? Um, answer, excuse me. I'm trying to get this thing to start on me. Not starting my things. Not starting. Oh, right. We won't worry about it starting. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered, How long will you, will you say these things? And the words of your mouth be mighty wind? Does God pervert justice? Or does the Almighty pervert what is right? If your sons sinned against him, then he delivered them into the power of their transgression. If you would seek God and implore the compassion of the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, surely now he would rouse himself for you and restore your righteous estate. Though your beginning was insignificant, yet your end will increase greatly. Please inquire of past generations and consider the things uh, searched out by their fathers. For we are only yesterday and now no, and know nothing, because our days on earth are as a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you and bring forth words from their minds? Can the papyrus grow up without a marsh? Can the rushes grow without water? While it is still green and not cut down, yet it withers before any other plant, so are the paths of all who forget God. And the hope of the goddess will perish, whose confidence is fragile, and whose trust and whose trust a spider's web. Oh, and whose trust a spider's web? He trusts in his house. But it does not stand. He holds fast to it, but it does not endure. He thrives before the sun, and his shoots spread out over his garden. His roots wrap around the rock pile. He grasps a house of stone. If he is removed from his place, then he will deny him, saying, I never saw you. Behold, this is the joy of his ways and out of the dust others will spring. Lo, God will not reject a man of integrity, nor will he support the evildoers. He will yet fill his mouth with laughter and your lips with shouting. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the tent of the wicked will be no longer. Then Job answered, In truth, I know that this is so, but how can a man be in the right before God. If if one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him once in a thousand times, wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has defended him without harm? It is God who removes the mountains. They know not how, when he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble. Who commands the sun not to shine and sets a seal upon the stars? Who alone stretches out the heavens 
and tramples down the waves of the sea? Who makes the bear Orion and Pleiades and the chambers of the south? Who does great things, unfathomable, unfathomable and wondrous words <coughs> without number? Were he to pass by me, I would not see him. Were he to move past, past me, I would not perceive him. Were he to snatch away, who could restrain him? Who could say to him, what are you doing? God will not turn back his anger beneath him. Uh, beneath him crouch the helpers of Rahab. Let me try that again. God will not turn back his anger. Beneath him crouched the helpers of Rahab. How then can I answer him and choose my words before him? For though I were right, I could not answer. I would have to implore the mercy of my judge. If I called and he answered me, I could not believe that he was listening to my voice. For he bruises me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds. Without cause, he will not allow me to get my breath, but saturates me with bitterness. If it is a matter of power, behold, he is the strong one. And if it is a matter of justice, who can summon him? Though I am righteous, my mouth will condemn me. Though I am guiltless, he will declare me guilty. I am guiltless. I do not take notice of myself. I despise my life. It is all one. Therefore, I say, he destroys the guiltless and the wicked. If the scourge kills suddenly, he mocks the despair of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? How my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They see no good. They slip by like reed boats, like an eagle that swoops on its prey. Though I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my sad countenance and be cheerful. I am afraid of all my pains. I know that I will not acquit. I know you will not acquit me. I am accounted wicked. Why then should I toil in vain if I should wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye? that you, yet you would plunge me into the pit, and my own clothes would abhor me, for he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, that we may go to court together. There is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both. Let him remove his rod from me, and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak, and not fear him. I am not like that in myself. I loathe my own life. I, my own life, I give full vent to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend with me. Is it right for you indeed to oppress, to reject, the labor of your hands, and to look favorably on the schemes of the wicked. Have your eyes, have you eyes of flesh? You, eyes of flesh? Oh, I'm sorry. Have you eyes of flesh? Or do you see as a man sees? Are your days as the days of a mortal? Or your years as a man's years that you should seek for my guilt and search after my sin according to your knowledge? I am indeed not guilty, yet there is no deliverance from your hand. Your hands fashioned me and made me altogether, and would you destroy me? Um, remember now that you have made me as clay, and would you turn me into dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. You have granted me life and loving kindness, and your care has preserved my spirit. Yet these things you have concealed in your heart. 
I know that this is within you. If I sin, then you would take note of me. And would not acquit me of my guilt. If I am wicked, woe to me. And if I am righteous, I dare not lift up my head. I am I am sated or sated with disgrace and conscious of my misery. Should my head be lifted up, would you hunt me like a lion? And again, would you show your power against me? You renew your witnesses against me and increase your anger towards me. Hardship after hardship is with me. Why then have you brought me out of the womb? Would that I have died and had no eye seen me. I should have been as though I had not been carried from womb to tomb. Would he not let my few days alone? Withdraw from me that I may have a little cheer before I go, and I shall not return to the land of darkness and deep shadow, the land of utter gloom as darkness itself of deep shadow, without order, and which shines as the darkness. <laughs> Is there any more sad ending you can think of to what Job is going through right there? He is both his friend and he are stating some prophetic truths that they probably are not aware of. His friend is still thinking that he's guilty because he's unrighteous. But if he would repent, if we'd acknowledge his guilt, God would reestablish him. God would give him better days ahead. He would he would be his essentially his redeemer. Because he says you will in the end your enemies will will see that God reestablishes you. And this does happen. Job is right in the sense that who can contend with God? Who can make a plan against God? He is right in the sense that even though he may be perfectly righteous, whether he's perfectly righteous or perfectly evil and rebellious, he cannot say anything against God. He, he has no right to complain against a perfect and holy God because he is the creation. The creation cannot lay a charge against the creator. It's um, not a possibility. Now, he's wrong in the sense that God would not hear him and consider his cry, that God is unapproachable. He is approachable. So much so, he sent his, his son. He sent himself in the second person of the Trinity so that we could approach him. So he is wrong in that sense. He's wrong in the sense that <coughs> in his mind that God is uncaring, that God is going to do whatever he wants to do. He says, even though I'm right, God still seems to want to um, destroy me, and I can't do anything about it. So there is, again, he's, and he mentioned, he says that, I'm going to cry out in my anguish. I'm just going to blurt this out. So he's, he's giving us the understanding that this is his emotions pouring out. It's not... Uh, thus saith Job prophetically. It's his emotions pouring out. How he perceives the world through his pain. And it's good to see this for us because we realize that God allows this. He allowed him to write it down so that we could benefit from it. So he sees that God is going to continue this this suffering upon him and that God is is indifferent to our suffering. And he's not indifferent to our suffering. We have Jesus Christ. And the Hebrews tell us he's true. He went, he went through all of the pains and sufferings that we go through so that we might know that we have somebody we can identify with. Whatever you're going through, if you're going through something, Jesus can identify with that because no one went through more trials than Jesus. Greater than Job, actually, when you stop and think about it. He took about the sin upon the whole world. 40 days of testing directly by Satan himself. No food, no water. There was a lot he went through. Phenomenal book. Well, we're going to just move on. We are uh, moving into uh, Matthew chapter 9. We're just going to cover the first uh, 17 verses. So let's um, see if... There we go. Getting into the boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. <coughs> Excuse me. Still getting him with his cold. 
And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And he got up and went home. And when the crowds saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God, who had given such authority to men. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him, asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but you, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. Matthew 9, 1 through 17. Um, I can't say that I totally understand what uh, Jesus is saying about which is easier to say. Your sins are forgiven or take your bed and watch. It seems like the, the word is, is about as easy as it says either. But I do know, <clears throat> I think, his spiritual lesson that he was trying to make there. And that is, Jesus came into this world to forgive sinners, first and foremost. The physical healing is the cream, of the, the, the cherry on top. It's, it's, it's the, the added benefit, the blessing to express his love. And it was a outward manifestation to demonstrate the inward forgiveness that took place. So for sure, when he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven when he wanted healing, what Jesus is indicating to this paralytic and to the entire world is, the greater sickness that we all have, we are all crippled with sin. And that's what Jesus sees. And the healing that this paralytic needed over and above physical healing was spiritual healing. And so Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And now he can fully walk with God. He can get up and leap and run with God. He has been restored to God. Pharisees think, okay, well, this is blasphemy because no one forgive, can forgive sins but God. And they're right. They were completely right. They just didn't realize they were dealing with God. And so he says to them, okay, and if you think you don't like that saying, you tell them, take up your bed and walk, go home. So they were to put the two together, gain the understanding of wow. So if he could do that with his body, this man had never walked. That means that what he said to begin with happened. 
The disciples certainly needed to pick up on that, should have picked up on that. And we should pick up on that. And this is why we love to see people healed physically, but why we will always focus in services and our time together with the greater healing that needs to be done. Any church that's all about physical healing to the expense of not communicating clearly and the need to be forgiven internally and, and that be the main focus, I think is out of balance. I don't, because we don't see Jesus doing that. Yes, he healed many, many people. Praise God, he still heals today. We want that, but not over and above that which God desires in his own heart, and that is for us to be healed inwardly. Charles Spurgeon now, but the Lord will not cast off you forever. Lamentations 331. He may cast away for a season, but not forever. A woman may leave off her ornaments for a few days, but she will not forget them nor throw them upon the dunghill. It is not like the Lord to cast off those whom he loves. For having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Some talk of our being in grace and out of it, as if we were like rabbits that run in and out of their burrows. But indeed, it is not so. The Lord's love is a far more serious and abiding matter than this. He chose us from eternity, and he will love us throughout eternity. He loved us so as to die for us, and we may therefore be sure that his love will never die. His honor is so wrapped up in the salvation of the believer that he can no more cast him off than he can cast off his own robes of office as king of glory. No, no. The Lord Jesus, as a head, never casts off his members as a husband. He never casts off his pride. Did you think you were cast off? Why did you think so evil of the Lord who has betrothed you to himself? Cast off such thoughts and never let them lodge in your soul of them. The Lord hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Romans 1, 11, 12. He hath putteth away. He hath put it, putteth away. <laughs> Malachi 2, 16. Boy, this goes hand in hand with Job, doesn't it? He's not cast you off. What makes you think that God stopped loving you or that God took away his hand from your life? Yeah, we'd be going through stuff like Job. But you're the ornament, you're the jewel that he has gone searching for, the treasure in the field, the pearl that he went and bought the field in order to find. So we may have those times where we feel like the Lord has abandoned us, but he's not. And uh, we have all the examples in the Bible of the Job's the people that have gone through extreme torment and realize at the end that God had not abandoned them. Paul went through so much. John, Peter, think about the persecutions they went through. The beatings they went through, the trials they went through. It would have been easy to think that God had forgotten them and abandoned them. David, think about King David. He does everything right. Now he's on his, his, he has to run from Saul for years leave his family, leave his home, his position, his job. All because what? He refused to sin against God. He refused to do anything that wasn't glorifying to God. He was not going to move one finger unless God moved it for him. And yet that brought him a lot of suffering. Just killed Saul in the cave. He was right there. Would have ended his problems. But what's he saying? No. I'm not going to lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. God is the one that's got to move Saul out of the way, not me. But but God's given him into your hands. He's right there. But he had no conviction of the Lord that this was God's plan. God had not moved him and saying and told him, this is my plan. And we do, we do well to see that in the Bible and do the same. I've not seen it in the word that God is telling me this is what I need to do. That I should take advantage of this situation and jump on it right now. I think it's better I wait on the Lord. And let him be the one to make that pathway open for me.
That's just a better way. But it, when we take that path, that higher path, it often means that the road can be a lot steeper or more difficult as we take it rather than the easy road that seems to be down the valley. Well, I hope that encourages you uh, to stay faithful in the Lord today. And I pray it's something I continue to remember as well. It's, uh, it's not always easy, is it? But it's a joyful walk we have with the Lord. And there's a peace in it and a glory in it. So let's continue this year as we go deeper in the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you so much for this beautiful morning. We do ask God for your, your mercy upon us as when we misunderstand the things you're doing in our life. Help us, God, to put it in perspective and to gain the understanding. And then surrender our wills to you and know that you are caring for us, that you do care, that we are important to you. You have not forgotten us. And for those of us that have people we love that are no far, we know are far away from you, that may be feeling that way, God help them today to send your love and find, somehow find the truth in your word. May it be revealed in the radio, something they read, something they see, a friend shares with them, whatever it is, God, make it known to them and available to them. Thank you, Father. For the joy of this day that we have, continue to move us, pray for the special uh, a special blessing on our trip as we drive today. We'd arrive safely without any problems, God, as we go back to Fredericksburg with um, Carly and, and Micah and the, and the kids. What a joy to spend that time with them. And, and Esty, God bless her as she has to get back to Italy, God, and, and help her to have a, just a wonderful, safe trip home and continue to bless her ministry as she's doing, giving her whole heart and soul to the work there in Turin. So thank you, Father. Um, we yield over this day fully to you in Jesus' name. Amen. There we go, guys. So uh, tomorrow, again, it's going to be crazy. But um do my best to get a manna for breakfast out. I think I will be able to. I think I know where we're going to be. So I look forward to seeing you then. Have a wonderful day. God bless. Bye-bye.